Hey folks, before we dive into today's podcast, I just wanted to let you know that the new and improved SuperPath Pro is up and running and it's awesome. So I'll just give you a quickie overview of what you get. SuperPath Pro members get access to a library of courses and content. They get monthly one-on-one calls where we pair you up with a peer and give you a simple agenda. It's an opportunity to meet people and kind of brainstorm and talk through content challenges. We're also doing monthly what we're calling SuperPath Socials. So these are group calls. We just did our first one. We had 45 people. There is a sort of large group component and then there's breakout sessions where you're put into smaller groups for sort of specific discussion on a content trend or problem. And then we're also doing private AMAs in the Slack group. So each month we bring in somebody for an AMA and we run that in the Slack group. So all of that is 500 bucks a year. Our goal is to make it the absolute best deal in content marketing. If you want to learn more about it, it's all on the homepage, superpath.co. And if you have any questions, feel free to hit us up. Thanks so much. And I think what I've learned from that process is, uh, A, like coming into my content roles, looking at the business problem and how can I impact the business from a strategic level where it's actually moving the needle in a larger way than just uh, the typical content metrics. So like, how how can I help drive revenue? How can I help build the story of the company? Uh, How can I help build brand? And, And these things don't always show up in metrics all the time. Hey, and thanks for tuning in to another episode of Content Briefly. Today, I'm very excited to present this conversation with Michael Lowe. He is currently the Senior Director of Corporate Marketing at a company called At Bay, but we didn't talk about that at all. We actually talked about a role he had a few years back at a company called Clary, which is a revenue operations platform. And he spent a couple years there working on a category creation play, basically trying to turn revenue operations into kind of a fringe idea, into a mainstream trend. So we get into all the details of that. We talk specifically about some of the differences between coining a term for marketing purposes versus actual category creation. We talk too about what he called the category creation tax. I'll let him explain it. Very interesting. And then we talk too just about some of like the nitty gritty tactical differences between how content works when you're running this category creation playbook versus if you're running a different type of content playbook. Really good stuff. This is a slightly different episode in that we like honed in on a theme from the beginning and spent the entire time unpacking it. So I really enjoyed it. Maybe we should do more of that. If you have feedback on that, you can always shoot us a note over email, jimmy at superpath.co or in the Slack group too. As always, I really enjoyed this conversation and I hope you do too. This episode of Content Briefly is brought to you by our friends at Captain. Captain is the hyper-contextual AI-powered tool that can create, engage, and identify. It helps you create by turning customer interviews, company announcements, competitor comparisons, and educational material into rich content. It helps you engage by automatically including lead magnets, infographics, CTA, table of contents, and even AI-generated conversational podcasts in every piece of content that it creates. By the way, it integrates with any CMS. It helps you identify by seeing who your anonymous site visitors are, including their name, email, where they work, job title, LinkedIn profile, and more. So you always know if you're finding the right audience, and that'll help you close more deals. You can learn more in the webinar that we did with them, which will be linked in the show notes, and at contentcaptain.io. And just P.S., the Captain team also created echoreads.io, which turns written content into monologue or two-way dialogue podcasts. You can even just click to clone your own voice so you're the expert speaking. Content Briefly is produced by our friends at Minutia. To learn more about their podcast production service, as well as their other adaptive content marketing services, check out minutia.com in the show notes. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Content Briefly. Very excited to have Michael Lowe on today. We actually just met br- briefly yesterday in the very first Superpath Social. Um, I'll probably plug that at some point in this podcast. Basically, a monthly group call for Superpath Pro members. We're doing uh, a big group call plus breakout sessions, so... Well, there. Thank you for being there, Michael. Um, we have a lot to discuss today. Specifically, we're going to get into category creation. Um, so, Michael, you're currently the senior director of corporate marketing at a company called At Bay, but we're going to go back in time just slightly to talk about a role you held at Clary and the category creation work you did there. So, we'll get into all that. Before before we do that, though, Michael, would you mind introducing yourself? Tell us a little yeah. bit about who you are and some of the work you've been up to for the past few years. Yeah, sure. Hey, everybody. Uh, Jimmy, thanks for having me. Big fan of Superpath. I uh, love what y'all are doing and grateful to be a part of the community. Um, so uh, I have been in content marketing for around 10 years now. I started as a journalist um, back in 2010 uh, and gained my my experience as a, as a writer in a newsroom for about five years. Made the shift over to tech uh, as a content marketer and have since worked my way up 
uh, from an individual contributor in various companies of various roles, uh, all the way to where I am now, where I lead content design and digital at AppBay, um, but have been in, in all sorts of companies with different uh, business models, which has been super interesting. Uh, the one that you mentioned, Clary, uh, was there for about four, almost five years, um, where it was a, a traditional B2B SaaS model, uh, but a big push for what we were doing in content brand and marketing uh, was developing the revenue operations category. So uh, lots of fun, interesting stories throughout my time and excited to share them. Cool. Awesome. Well, maybe we just dive into it. So, you know, having the podcast, like, you know, email back and forth with guests, like, we you know, are there some things we should hit on? And uh, you sent over a couple of ideas. The one that really stood out to me was some of the work you did at Clary, specifically building out the revenue operations category. So maybe we start there. What is Clary and what is revenue operations? Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So um, Clary is a, uh, I think they call it a revenue op orchestration platform now. Uh, but when I joined, it was really known as a forecasting platform for sales managers and sales leaders. And um, what we realized was that uh, we were doing something that nobody else was doing. Uh, we were oftentimes uh, building a product that people didn't realize they needed yet. Uh, but when we did, and when we got it in front of people, they were like, oh my God, I never knew I needed this. Uh, we started having this, this raving community of fans uh, that people would would bet their careers on to buy this thing because it was, it was not cheap. Um, and so because of that, uh, and because nobody really uh, knew what to call this thing that we had, we were, we were a forecasting platform, but we did more than that. Uh, and we weren't, a lot of people kind of compared us to Salesforce, but we did a lot more than, than CRM um, and surface data in a different way. Uh, we decided to embark on, on category creation. And that process of going through the category creation uh, experience was very long, took a lot of steps. Um, but the idea is that we honed in on this idea of revenue operations, which we saw a growing community of folks who are identifying with a revenue operations title and methodology. Um, and it's really like the connected uh, go-to-market motion for sales, marketing, customer success, uh, all with the focused effort of driving more predictable revenue. So uh, that's kind of where we started. Um, this kind of understanding that we were known as one thing, forecasting, uh, but we did so much more and that that thing did not exist as a known quantity in uh, in the B2B world. And so we had to create that terminology, create that category, become a, uh, a known thing so that people could essentially put it in their budget. Because uh, that's really, yeah, yeah. that's really like the, the output of a good category. There, okay. Did, did Clary come up with the term revenue operations or rev ops? So... I will say that I think we kind of co-opted it. Uh, we okay. saw this this trend among the people that were using um, our, uh, our our platform, uh, and they had this revenue operations title, and it it really resonated. I think with our mission to drive more predictable revenue, uh, a lot of them were sort of sales operations folks who were maturing into a more leadership role and taking on this revenue operations title, um, and. Over the course of my time at Clary, uh, we jumped onto it. We sort of found those people and empowered them uh, to have a voice. And because of that, we kind of became known as like the revenue operations place to be, the revenue operations yeah. platform, and uh, really gained their trust, I think, by delivering value and listening to them and, and, and making sure that we were uh, meeting their needs. Yeah, yeah. I will flag this right now as marketing lesson number one from this podcast, which is notice the trend and grab it. Right. Yes. Like, I, I sort of imagine, I sometimes I think of when I think of category creation, I think of like people in a room, like coming up with the category and then fleshing out what it is. But you kind of drew a line around this somewhat abstract idea to clarify it for people. So, like, the trend already exists, you clarify it, and then that gives you the opportunity to kind of quote unquote own that idea. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And, and I do see this a lot as well, where, uh, you know, people are sitting in a room trying to think of like the catchiest category to come up with because they want to create it. Uh, we were fortunate in that we were able to kind of ride this wave 
Uh, but I think we f- we knew that if we could feed the wave, that it would just grow and grow and grow. And that was sort of the direction that we we took. Um, one of the ways that we measured whether this would be a good idea to actually embark on category creation is seeing like this small marginalized group of buyers or users um, who really believe strongly in this idea of, for us, it was driving predictable revenue and controlling and orchestrating the way a revenue process works. And so we, we right, part of the key of, of figuring out which category it is, is identifying that, that group who uh, can sort of like be the flag bearers for you. Um, because if, if you're the one, if you're the only one talking about the category, like it becomes very clear, very quickly, uh, what you're trying to do and trying to sell a product. But if you can instead lift up those folks, um, you know, it becomes way more powerful. It's not about you anymore. It's about the category, this movement. Um, and I think by being the fuel for that through content and community and events and you know research all of these things you by default start to be seen as the category leader the yeah. category owner and that's that's sort of the play you mentioned a few minutes ago that clearly is expensive i just checked the website and there's no pricing listed on it i'm not asking for the actual price but i guess what i'm sort of getting at is are the deals enterprise type deals and then the follow up to that sort of the direction i'm heading here is is high customer lifetime value a requirement for a category creation effort? Meaning like, is the effort, is, is the effort level high enough that there has to be like a pretty attractive, um, pretty attractive customer lifetime value on the other side of that to make it worthwhile? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, so to answer your first question, price point was enterprise for sure. Uh, we did have a uh, small, smaller business like SMB size uh, opportunity that we expanded into. Uh, but in general, it was uh, when I was there, um, relatively, relatively expensive. Um, and it was because of the value that we believed we were giving, and we were we were truly able to bring visibility into the revenue process and drive. A better a better revenue process or a better sales process, um, and so because of that, I think we we felt strongly about it. Uh, in terms of the lifetime value, um, I think in order to go after category creation, another sort of box that we checked was uh, whether or not we felt there was a community of believers who would put their not like career on the line, that sounds dramatic, but but who are willing to stand up and say, like, I need this. And, and we did see this before we even embarked on category creation. We saw customers who would not take a job unless they had Clary or unless they like got a commitment Whoa. that the, the company would buy. That's Clary. cool. Like it was yeah, that yeah, serious. Really cool. And we'd see these like repeat customers who would go to different uh, companies and they would bring Clary with them. And uh, so I think because of that, we, we felt like, the need for the buyer and the um, the value that we were providing was strong enough to go and, and create the category because it is it is it is you know a, a, a lot of work to create a category. It takes a lot of time, you need a lot of resources, right? And at the time, um, you know, we were still a, a high growth startup that was venture backed, and so we had really aggressive revenue numbers to hit. And, and in a lot of ways, category creation doesn't impact those revenue numbers right away. It takes some time for analysts to get on board, for people to adopt the idea. And because of that, like you really need to work a lot on getting executive buy-in, internal buy-in, like communicating it all the time to uh, to the people inside the company. So they understand like, why are we talking about this thing that doesn't exist yet? Right. Uh, when we could be talking about forecasting, for example. Right, which we know, like people will buy our product if we call it a forecasting platform, but then we sort of lose out on the value of a long-term category play. So, a lot of like really interesting conversations that we had inside, and uh, it does it does take a long-term commitment. Um, I had a question already for you. 
Okay, yeah, actually, one of the things that I was going to ask you is, is category creation easier or harder, harder than, you know, regular, uh, you know, whatever that means, regular content marketing? And like where my brain is at is, okay, is it, it's, I'm sure it's harder, right? Because you're sort of, you're kind of paving this, paving this new path, right? And then on the other hand, maybe it's a little easier because I'm just, what I'm wondering is, does the team galvanize around it? Mm. Like your mission is so clear. And does that, does that actually make the work somewhat easier or maybe is just a muddy answer and it's kind of some of both? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a really good question. I will say that initially when we embarked on this, uh, there was not a lot of galvanization. Uh, mm. We had to really sell it internally because again, the, the revenue goals uh, were so aggressive for us that any type of initiative that was taking resources away from supporting revenue was really hard to sell. Yeah, And so we had to have this conversation internally of saying, look, we're going to figure out how to do both at the same time because we have to. If we, can't, if we do category creation, but we lose on the revenue, like we're not going to be able to keep the lights on for long mm. enough. Makes and sense. so we had to figure out, we, we took this approach of having um, like the, these two funnel, this is like a two funnel approach. It's like almost, we had two go to market motions. One that was aimed at people who we knew wanted the product for what it was now and would like buy immediately. So these were like the demand growth uh, sort of campaigns and initiatives that content, uh, which was my role at the time, uh, would support. And then the other go to market was the broader category creation strategy that was like the long term slow burn type stuff. And so um, I think over time, you know, we luckily our marketing team was incredible and very mature. And and even though there were some folks who were like a little bit reluctant, we uh, we disagreed and we committed and we pulled it off and we we just we just kind of did it. Um, one of the things that that kind of helped was you know having executives constantly talking about why we're doing category creation, what it means for us, how it's going to impact the business long term. Um, just like at every all hands, it was constantly drilled into everybody which helped from a leadership standpoint. Um, from a marketing standpoint, we introduced this thing uh, called the category tax, which I thought was kind of funny, um, where basically like in every meeting, in anything that we did, in any asset that we created, uh, we had this category tax where we would have to talk about revenue operations in some way. Uh, Whoa, that's kind of cool. I did, like that. Yeah. And it, it kind of like, you know, it kind of made it fun uh, without, you know, making making it like a super hard call like you you have to do this thing right um and it didn't have to be a lot it could be just a, a line be a sentence it could be a paragraph it could be you know more than that but it just kind of helped to reinforce like hey we are all doing this thing um and we're gonna we're gonna like pay the tax every single time we do something that's very interesting i feel like this might be the right place to call out the difference between coining a term for the purposes of marketing and actual category creation. So examples of coining a term would be like drift and conversational marketing or back in the day, Zwar, this company called Zwara and mm -hmm. the subscription economy, you know, they're mm -hmm. just like you, you, you grab onto this great term and it just kind of gives you this platform to talk about the thing your product does. And then what you're talking about at Clary, which is proper category creation, where the tool or maybe a, the set of features enable something that wasn't possible before. And it actually needs a new name. And then that it's like the, the marketing team is almost destined to go down this route. Does, does that feel roughly accurate? Yeah, I, I can see that. I think um, one of the differences in, in like coining a term versus category creation that I've seen, at least in my experience, is that uh, I feel like when, when companies and teams try to coin a term, it's really talking about them. Like you said, it's, it's a way for them to talk about their own product. It's like, this is how we're framing the thing that we're doing. And we want to tell you about us. Uh, when we're thinking about category creation, uh, it's really about the buyers and the audience. And it's about what, what those revenue operations professionals need. Um, and so to me, it feels almost reversed in saying, like, mm, we're, yeah. we're just like the vessel for this revenue operations movement. And we're going to be capturing all of this expertise and know-how and, um, and you know, subject matter experts coming in and, and giving them a platform to talk about revenue operations and the way that they do it uh, just so happens to be with Clary, 
but like the methodology and the philosophy behind it is uh, is something that we try not to necessarily make come from Clary. It, it comes from there. I'll give you an example. So one of the like five main things that we tried to, to do um, was around building this revenue operations community. And uh, one of the, the initiatives that I thought was really, really successful is that we actually developed this small group of revenue operations executives and we called them the revenue operations council. And they were Clary customers who had been with us for a long time and they sort of embodied like the philosophies of revenue operations, driving predictable revenue, um, driving revenue like a process. Uh, and we would work with them on these big pieces of like content and it felt like almost academic research because we'd have diagrams for how they were mapping out sales stages and exit criteria and uh, mutual action plans and like all of this like almost technical like sales uh, philosophy and methodology and approaches. Um, and we would put their names on it and we would say, look, you know, we, we are, we are lifting you all up. We're building a platform for you to be these like subject matter experts in this growing revenue operations category. Um, and, and they were received super well. Uh, I know we had, we had one like COO print out the entire white paper for like everybody on their team on their first oh, day awesome. as a COO. And I was like, all right, this is the playbook. And, and like literally just gave it to like all 20 other direct reports were like, read this. This is how we're running the revenue. And it's cool because like, these are the things that um, don't show up in the analytics. Right. But, mm, but yeah. you, you know that they work because people are resonating with them. And that's again, how you, how we're building this affinity uh, for us as like a revenue operations platform. Yeah. Yeah. I, that's so interesting. I would love to get into some of like the nitty gritty, like, Okay, yeah. you and the content team, you're sitting down for your weekly meeting, you're assigning out articles to be written to the writers, you're editing, you're publishing, you're distributing, like what's, what are the differences? I mean, I whatever type of content program you're running, you're, you're doing those things. So if you're in this category creation motion, what are the differences? What things are you doing there that you might not be doing otherwise? Yeah, uh, great question. So, um, you know, I think the first thing that I'll say is that it, it was a super interesting experience because I came into Clary as a senior content marketing manager. Um, I, I approached content as like a probably in the wrong way, which, which is all about like quantity and volume. And I was like, all right, I gotta get through my like editorial calendar and stuff like that. And over the time there, um, what I realized the company really needed was, uh, for me to look at the business problem that we're trying to solve and then translate content programs in that manner. And so category creation was not something that I had uh, on my you know, job description, uh, but it was what the company needed. And so uh, it was it was really interesting to like go through that process of kind of shifting my mentality away from, okay, you know, I'm just doing content. I'm just uh, kind of being a service provider into a more strategic role where I could kind of take a look at what are the problems we're trying to solve and how can content solve it? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So to your, to your question, um, content really drove a lot of the uh, foundational like initiatives that fueled the category creation. So there was, there was five main ones that we kind of focused on because we knew we couldn't do everything. We were still a small team. We knew we still had to do all the revenue driving initiatives and that you know, uh, category creation was, was only a part of my job. And so we, we took five initiatives and we decided to make bets on those. Um, the first one was SEO. Uh, we knew that if we could own the term revenue operations, we get to define the term and everybody who hears about this term and then goes search for it, will find our content. And then now, you know, category or revenue operations is, is what we call it. Right. And, and, and how we define it, and that that basically helps to create that category. Got it. Uh, the sec the second is community, and so we did, uh, like I said, the revenue operations council, like these white papers, these academic stuff, uh, trying to uh, tell customer stories, but not in a way that um, you know talked about Clary the product. It was about like what their what these revenue operations professionals were um, were doing in their day jobs, and like the philosophy that they were using to approach their their job. 
Um, so a lot of like customer third party validation type stuff. Um, the third one was working with analysts. So we had an analyst team uh, working with Gartner and um, uh, Forrester. But then from a content perspective, we were also engaging with them on like the TLP, the TEI papers, uh, getting that like, again, third party validation from the analysts. Um, and then two more, which were executive platform. So, so getting our CEO out uh, in front of people talking about uh, revenue operations and what it means and why it's important. Uh, and then the fifth one, which is kind of interesting, is um, is the internal communications, doing the category tax, making sure that like everybody was like living and breathing from a like a cultural value perspective, uh, this revenue operations thing, and, and that manifested in a ton of social activity on, on LinkedIn, which created this like really big halo effect. Uh, so went through a lot there, but uh, yeah, but yeah, you know, content really fueled everything here. You know, I, I was not expecting you to say internal communications as the fifth one. I thought you were going to say something about distribution or something like that. Yeah. Very interesting. Did the, did the category creation, uh, the, the cultural part of it, is it top down? You know what I mean? Is it being kind of reinforced from the highest level or was it bottoms up where the marketing team is saying like, we need to do this and you're sort of slowly building buy-in and momentum? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I think it's a little bit of both. Um, definitely need that executive buy-in, the executive uh, communications of always talking about this thing. Um, but then also, right, as the marketing, like we have to lead by example. Uh, so like we're the ones posting on social. We, Whenever we had a big like revenue operations launch or a big brand piece or like a piece of content come out, we would um, we would develop like a social plan where, where we would provide prompts and like responses and coordinate across the whole company um, all right, this this piece is coming out. We're going to post it on LinkedIn. We're going to share the LinkedIn link. Go and like comment on it. Here are some comment ideas, right? Just to create this like groundswell and make it easy for them, right? Because everybody else has day jobs too. And so I think from a from a bottoms up perspective, it's about leading from it by example. And it's about making it easy for everybody else to like feel engaged and feel a part of it. Uh, and, and that was like in the early days of, I feel like LinkedIn really blowing up. And so we got, I mean, massive play from it. Also the fact that our, our audience is sales. And so, you know, everyone from sales is on LinkedIn. So yeah, uh, that had just a huge um, outsized value for us. Yeah. Yeah. Was this easier or more difficult to measure than other content? That's a good question. Um, I think it's a little bit of both. Uh, it's harder because it's it's a little bit fuzzy, right? There's, uh, it's long term. It doesn't show up as revenue numbers necessarily, but everything we try to do for category creation, we tried to use in our demand gen. So when we were writing the Revenue Operations Council papers, right, it was really like a brand play first. But we would be you know sharing them with the growth team to use as like demand gen pieces. And so we tried to do a little bit of both. Uh, the things that we tried to communicate in terms of how are we how, how are we progressing in the category actually being created uh, are things like um, uh, revenue operations, keyword searches and impressions. Yeah, yeah. Um, things like references, uh, revenue operations references and like analyst papers. Um, things like uh, backlinks to our revenue operations pillar piece. Basically seeing like are there... Are there people out there uh, recognizing us as a authority in this space, referencing what we're doing, linking to what we're doing? Um, and, and, and over time, uh, I think the big one that we saw was job uh, job title growth in revenue operations. I think it was like last year when revenue operations was like the number one highest uh, growth title. That's uh, so cool. Like That's people interesting. Like, yeah, because... Yeah, because at the end of the day, like category creation is trying to find that cohort of people who want to identify themselves with you and your movement. And so the more people that were calling themselves revenue operations professionals, the more we felt like, okay, this is like, this is picking up steam and we got to, we got to continue putting fuel on the fire. Yeah. I, I will, I'll just quick flag that as a, a key way to differentiate between category creation and coining a term. Like if you're coining a term, you're probably not going to see that in people's LinkedIn job titles. You know, category creation, I never thought of it that way, but it makes total sense that like as that movement gains 
momentum that more people identify with it. The job titles start uh, appearing, and um, that's real. I've, what I've, yeah, never thought of measuring content in that way before. But like, what a cool way to think about it. Super interesting. The other thing that we saw was um, companies putting job postings out for revenue operations titles that required Clary as a like known. Like you, you have to have experience with Clary to like be qualified for this job Dang, and job yeah, titles cool. the operations. So like that's where you're starting to see the you know Clary as a company being associated with revenue operations profession. So again, these these are things that uh, are not like out of the box uh, measurement uh, tools that you can do. It takes a lot of sort of like anecdotal investigation work, um, but you know in a lot of ways that's sort of the 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 path of category creation. It's a yeah. little bit squishy and you just have to like tell that story of um, how, how it's starting to manifest itself out in the wild. Right. Man, it's so interesting. I have one more question for you, Michael. Yeah. You have moved on to other roles since then. Are there lessons learned or, kind of, uh, you know, things that you apply at other companies where you're running a different playbook Mm. Meaning like, yeah, stuff you learned in the category creation process that you found to be maybe kind of more u- universally applicable that you've found yourself leaning on since then. Yeah, that's a super good question. Um, I think going back to your last question, right, the interesting thing about category creation is that it wasn't about like measuring page views or impressions. Like that's the con- the typical content metrics didn't necessarily always apply. It, it was part of the story, but not all of the story. And I think what I've learned from that process is, uh, A, like coming into my content roles, looking at the business problem and how can I impact the business from a strategic level where it's actually moving the needle in a larger way than just uh, the typical content metrics. So like, how, how can I help drive revenue? How can I help build the story of the company? Uh, how can I help build brand? And, and these things don't always show up in metrics all the time. Um, but what I've, what I've found is that, uh, you know, this, this process of kind of approaching content in a more entrepreneurial spirit, um, really helps me to, I think, pitch ideas, speak the same language as the business, as executives. And these are things that I I don't know about you, Jimmy, but I did not learn this in school. Like I did not, not know, uh, any of this business stuff before coming in, I did definitely didn't learn it as a journalist. And I felt very like out of my depth when I first got into tech. Um, but all of these sort of like soft skills, telling the story of what you're doing, um, identifying the business need, translating that into like a content initiative. All of these things are super important, in my opinion, to, to success as a content marketer, especially in today's world. Um, and bringing that to the table, I think has really helped me in my career uh, kind of stepping out of it. Most content marketers are, are really great writers. They are really great researchers. Like they know how to tell a story. Um, the thing, the gap that I've seen in, in my experience and in the people I've talked to is like, how do I speak the business of the language? How do I translate those content initiatives into business impact? Uh, and, and if you can figure those things out, then uh, I feel like uh, sky's the limit for you as a content marketer. And that's, that's uh, what, what's helped me, at least in my career. Yeah, I love that. That's awesome. I, I, I'm thinking you're reminding me of this article I read a few years ago. And I'm blanking on the name of the woman who wrote it. Essentially explaining, she was a designer at Facebook, I think. Julie Zhao, maybe? I'll try to find the article and put it in the show notes. But essentially, the article is about career development. And she talks about how like your career starts based on your technical skills. Can you write, design, mm. code, et cetera? And then over time, it transitions into, can you get shit done or not? You know, it's like the soft skills yeah. become so much more important. Can you advocate for a project? Can you rally a team of people around it? Can you keep yeah. people on deadline? Can you just like get it done? You know, kind of like own the narrative of it, et cetera. And uh, that's, that sounds like, you know, there's a big difference between like running a content playbook and then running a category creation playbook. You know, super interesting to hear you talk through some of the differences, but it yeah. feels like it it does rely quite a bit more heavily on the on the soft skills part, as you said. Yeah, and, and a lot of the tactics are the same, right? SEO, social, uh, you know, long form ebook writing, like a lot of those are still the same. It's it's just understanding how to connect those tactics to the larger business strategy, and then 
tell the story to leadership about what you're doing, why you're doing it, how the how it's impacting the business. Um, it, it's super important. Again, these are things that like I think everybody can learn. Uh, it takes work. It's not easy. It's not something that I I was comfortable with when I got into this. Uh, but the more and more I kind of grow in my career, the more I realize just how critical it is to success. Yeah, love it. Michael, thank you so much for coming on. This episode was a little different than most of our episodes in the sense that um, we kind of came in with the theme and unpacked it. And usually we talk to a person and kind of figure out the theme as we go and go down a few rabbit holes, which is fun too. But this was just a cool break, I think, from our typical format. Um, so thank you. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for sharing the yeah. story. Uh, so where's the, the best place for us to send folks to connect with you, assuming LinkedIn or maybe a personal website? Yeah, uh, just LinkedIn right now. Um, look me up on LinkedIn, shoot me a, a message. Uh, I love talking about this stuff, as you can probably tell. Uh, very passionate about both you know, content marketing uh, from a strategic standpoint and also uh, hel- helping folks in their content marketing career because I, I truly believe that uh, content marketers in general are, are under-resourced, they're, they're under, under-appreciated, yeah, they're overworked, <laughs> um, and, and I think we deserve a whole lot more. So uh, I, I love mentoring, coaching folks, and uh, happy to help where I can. Amazing. Well, I'll grab the link to your uh, LinkedIn profile and I'll drop it in the show notes so cool. folks can find it easily. Michael, thank you so much. Uh, seriously appreciate the time and hope we can do a round two sometime. Yeah, would love to. Thanks, Jimmy. Take care. Take care.